Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Somehow or other, we worked it out to where Phil had both the song leading today and also the sermon for tonight. And and we thought maybe it wasn't, shouldn't actually just be the Phil show all evening long. So he looked for replacements, and my name came up somehow. He made slides for both, though, but it turns out that Phil and I are different people, and we do things different ways. So these slides are exactly the way that Phil made them, other than the changes that I made. So let's start tonight with number 378. 378. My hope is filled by happiness when he does fall in righteousness. I give my heart for the sweetest drink, for the holy
number 603, 603. And then the song before this evening's message is number 608, 608. The love of God is greater far than the love of man personal note, thank you, Jason, for leading the singing tonight, and uh, I also want to thank Troy for the other Wednesday night. I uh, did not see my name at the bottom of the list, and it went right over my head, so thank you, Troy. And uh, another personal note, uh, uh, some of you have asked about Ethan. Uh, uh, he had a cast, uh, he was x-rayed, and everything is going to be healing fine, so he didn't have to have surgery, and I uh, want to thank you for your prayers on his behalf. Hope and why you should have it. Hope is virtually free, much, but you must, must act now for this fantastic offer. So what is hope? Uh, on Sunday morning, uh, my dear wife fills the coffee cup so we can sip it on the way to church. And uh, 
I was hoping to expect that, uh, I shouldn't expect, but I always hope she has the coffee ready by the time we leave. And she is a darling, and she does. And so hope is an expectation or a desire for a certain thing to happen. A feeling of trust to expect with confidence. And um, so this is what we hope and desire. And hope is the opposite of despair and sadness and um, other negative things we have in life. Well, you know, sometimes people close to us let us down. The world seems to go crazy at times, like it does now, it seems. But there is always a reason for hope. And we're going to show you that there is a valid reason and rational reason for hope for the Christian. The Christian has a valid and rational reason for hope. And we're going to show you scriptures that support that. We're going to show you scriptures of where the sinner, the person outside of Christ stands, and then show you that even the sinner has hope. Now, this is a little bit philosophical, but a rational person must have justification for what he believes in and acts upon it. That is, he has a reason to believe. I think you've seen this slide before, or a similar version, but in logic, no one is allowed to be arbitrary. Only the Christian worldview provides a reason to believe in a hope. Only the Christian has justification for only the Christian has real objective hope. And we're going to show some scriptures that support that. Now, where is there no hope at the present time unless these people change? And that is in four categories. Humanism, humanism atheism, skepticism about God and the Bible, and evolutionism. And the reason that these people don't have hope it's because if you are a mere cosmological, that is, astronomical, or biological accident, there is only uncertainty. Because uh, by these isms, uh, you are only here because of a low probability of occurrence. Now, what kind of hope is there in that? That you are here because of a low probability of occurrence. There is no hope in that kind of ism. There is no objective or promised hope for those who place their faith in a material world. When is there more hope? Well, there is more hope when we realize that man is, man is actually constructed of three parts, a body, soul, and a spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.32 says the same thing, that man is three parts, body, spirit, and soul. And in Genesis 2 and 7, we have these words, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature, or as King James says, a living soul. So there's more to this material world than just, there's more to this world than just the material. God is the spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. So man must also concern himself self with the reality of the spiritual world. And this is where those four isms do not do. They don't concern themselves with the spiritual world. They can't wrap their minds around the spiritual world. Everything to them is material. If they can't see it, they can't believe it. But we know that if they can't believe in some spiritual entity that created this world, how can they have hope? Because if you are a simply a low probability of occurrence, then there is no hope. Do you remember the commercials that came on black and white and the first color television? The Ronco Vegematic. Now, there is a later version of this uh, TV commercial that says, This kitchen device slices, dices, and cubes vegetables, fruits, and meat. And uh, so they show beautiful uh, 
vegetables and uh, uh, fruits uh, rolling out onto the counter after you hit the plunger. And for 1995, if you order this right now, you can receive not just one, but two at the same price. Just pay extra price for shipping. <laughs> so this is a sales promotional. But yes, the Bible promotes hope as well. This was an interesting scripture I found after reviewing this topic. Did you know that hope was promised before the world began? Titus 1 and 3 says, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. And other translations say, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. But before we can have hope, we must have faith. You remember this scripture, Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. This was referring to God's creation, of course, and, of course, Jesus Christ is written in the Bible. So faith is a precondition to hope. Faith is not some hollow wish, but is based on evidences and promises we have before us, especially in the Scripture. So what does hope do for us? Well, hope purifies us. 1 John 3 and 3 says, And everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Hope purifies us. It makes us ceremonially clean, if you wish. Uh, hope removes contaminants from our lives. My wife found a coffee filter for me. Remember these old coffee filters? Before Curie came along? Well, when the coffee comes through, it traps contaminants. Large particles and stuff you don't want in your coffee. Well, hope does the same thing. It purifies it. What does hope do for us? Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, of which you have previously heard in the word of the gospel, Colossians 1 and 5. Going down to verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, and not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven. Going down to verse 27, to whom God willed to make known that the wealth of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles is the mystery that is in Christ, in you, the hope of glory. So hope is within us all who believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and hope is within the gospel that we have heard. What else does hope do for us? Titus 3 and 7, for that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So hope gives us eternal life as well. What else does hope do for us? Hope anchors the soul. Uh, when a ship drops anchors out in the water, uh, what does it do? It stabilizes the ship. When a ship wants to drift too far uh, by the tide, those anchors in the front and rear bring the ship back to its charging pointing. So it anchors the soul. In fact, uh, song number 496 says, we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. So hope is also an anchor for us. It stabilizes us. What kind of hope should we have? First Peter 1 and 3. I really like this one. Because, you know, sometimes we, we go through life, our heads down like this. But what kind of hope should we have according to the Scriptures? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a lively hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So this hope is an exuberant hope. It's an enthusiastic hope. So because, because of that, should not we impart this enthusiastic hope to friends and neighbors and people out in the world? What does the sinner have outside the purview of God? What kind of hope does he have in his present condition? 
Job 21.17 says, How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? Or does their disaster fall on them? Or does God apportion destruction in his anger? Matthew 3 and 12. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff in an unquenchable fire. Now this is the winnowing floor that was used in ancient times. You cut the wheat or the barley or the rye out in the field, you bring it to the winnowing floor, and then, let me back up one, you use a pitchfork or a shovel when the wind is high, and what happens is the wind blows away the chaff and the stuff you don't want in the grain. And then when the chaff is separated from the grain, only the grain is brought into the barn for storage. What happens to the chaff that's blown away? It's burnt. Ephesians 2 and 12, remember that you were at one time separated, or at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in this world. So this is comparing the sinner to those outside of Jesus Christ and outside of hope. Now we have seen that the Christian has a valid, rational, justified hope because God's word ensures us of such a hope. Titus 3 and 7 says that so being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Notice this is the second time, the second scripture where you've seen that hope equals eternal life. Now let's turn to uh, John the uh, eighth chapter in our Bible. This is the this is an artist concept or an artist rendition of uh, John eight, uh, and we're going to be reading verses one through eleven. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may remember that uh, Jesus had gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, later the previous day, and most likely he prayed. The scriptures doesn't say. He prayed, but most likely he did because that was his example in, in other scriptures. Before he was to teach, he always went out to pray. And that's a great example for us. Now again, uh, this is a artist rendition, an artist concept of what may have happened. The scripture says that this lady or this person was put into the midst of them. But let's read uh, from the NIV. John 8, 1 through 4 first. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again into the, in the temple court, where all the people gathered around him and to sat down to teach with them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, or scribes and Pharisees, brought in a woman caught in um, adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, there was a number of questions I had to ask when reviewing this. And I think artists touched on this in some of his previous sermons as well. Number one, where did the scribes and Pharisees find this woman? How did they find this woman? How did they know of this woman? And uh, so here is Jesus in the temple. He's setting down for a nice teaching situation, and in comes the troublemakers, the scribes and the Pharisees. Why, why, why did they bring this woman in in the first place? Why didn't they go ahead and stone her if this was the law? Well, because they wanted to make fun of him, they wanted to accuse him, so that they could put him up to some kind of trial and degrade his uh, his teaching. So, right now, I want you to look at the uh, face of the woman. 
Uh, this is supposedly the adulteress. She was brought to the group of Seth in the middle. Now, we don't know if later on she laid at the feet of Jesus or not, but in the artist's conception, she's at the feet of Jesus. So, I want you to pay particular attention to her facial expression, her body language. Is this the body language of hope and joy? It's quite the opposite. She's in despair. What is going to happen to me? What are they going to do to me? How are they going to judge me? How is this man called Christ going to judge me? So let's read on then from uh, 5 through 11. In the, in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you are without sin, let him begin stoning her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with a woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Jesus then said, Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave. Go, go now and leave your life of sin. I often wondered, what was Jesus writing? The scriptures don't tell us. Did he go over and stoop down and start writing the names of some of the people who had already committed adultery? Did he go over and start writing the names of those who had been with this exact lady, a girl, or young female? We assume a young female. So he goes over and writes in the, in the, in the, in the ground, and uh, they press him. Well, what do you say, teacher? He says, Are any of you without sin? If so, throw the first stone. Well, it turns out the older people, the older guys in the group, and then the younger ones finally start to walk away. And then what we see is that Christ then stood up after writing on the ground. He sees only he and the alleged adulteress. I say alleged because that's modern language in courts. They did this alleged thing. So, undoubtedly, she now has some hope. She is no longer in despair. She now knows what her future is going to be. But also notice, Jesus did not give her carte blanche to do what she had been doing before. He said, go now and sin no more. And uh, so it's just she and him standing there. He essentially pardons her, but says, do not sin anymore. So now this this person that was accused now has hope. She now knows what her future is going to be, but she has a responsibility to go and sin no more. Now, we also know that there is hope for the sinner as well. I tell you that in the same way, from Luke 15 and 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. So, the Christian has hope, as we've shown in the previous scriptures, but there's also hope for the sinner if only he turns away from the sin. Hope for the sinner can come through conversion by a study of his word, belief in Jesus Christ, a sincere repentance uh, of sin, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, be baptized by immersion, and continue in obedience. 
So we have to ask you tonight, do you have despair in your life or feel you are without hope? If you have a need tonight, your loving family here at Center Point will assist you in any need you may have as we sing the song of encouragement. Bible class tomorrow night here at the building at 7 p.m. Uh, and I think I heard a uh, sewing workshop Thursday morning. That's all right. Seeing a lot of nodding heads. Good. Um, is there anything else that we might need to know? Oh, and remember uh, the thing over Iowa on Saturday at 2 p.m. at some point? At the Cedar Loop. If there's nothing else, let's bow and be dismissed in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you are our hope. You have provided your Son as the sacrificial lamb that takes away our sins, that gives us a hope of heaven. We have our eyes set on you. We have our goals set on you, on glorifying you and living for you, giving you our lives. We ask God that you help us to do that as we depart from here. Help us to travel safely. Help us to be well for those that might be suffering from physical ailments or sicknesses. Help them to get better so that they can spread your word, spread your love better in this world. Help us always to remember your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.